Hey everybody! So today we are going to be going through some spring training since it is baseball season now. Yay! Uh, hopefully we can go and see some games or at least watch them on TV. <laughs> And I am going to be going through how to actually encode the taxonomy and knowledge model, aka ontology, that you saw in my no code videos. Those are linked below and I'm going to put some cards up here so you can go and check those out. So I will be walking you through step by step so you can follow along. All right, and today we are going to be doing this in Protege. It is a free and open tool. It is very popular for people to use. I know there might be some controversy in starting your taxonomy in Protege since it really is a knowledge modeling tool for ontologies, but I actually think if you're going to use a taxonomy, you're eventually going to need an ontology or a knowledge model anyway, so it's a good place to start. All right, so with that, let's go get started. Everyone, you can go and download it, or you could use Web Protege. More to come on Web Protege soon. All right, so the first thing you want to start with is what are you naming this thing? Uh, right now it's untitled, so let's just call it YouTube Pizza Tax Taxonomy. Okay, and version one. B1. All right, so we are not going to focus too much on the metadata of the actual taxonomy that we are working on, although that is a very important aspect. I'm just going to skip over it for now because I will probably have a whole video talking about the provenance and how you want to track this sort of thing. Uh, but for now, let's make sure that people know who is creating this. So we're going to do that by creating an annotation. Annotations are the metadata associated with individual things. So either that is a class or the entire taxonomy. So here we're going to say that this is DC creator. Okay. And it's C. This IRI tells us that it knows what I'm talking about. So I'm going to say yes. Now we can use that. Go ahead and select. I'm going to put my name. And this is a literal, so it doesn't have a language because literals are just whatever it is. So you can see that the creator is Ashley Faith. Cool. All right, so let's get into the actual vocab. So the first step we need to do is to actually populate this with vocabulary terms. Now you can start with a pre-existing vocabulary. You can start with an open or closed card sort. And the original video, uh, for no code taxonomy actually walks through what that would look like. You can do a bi-directional card sort, which is something that I have uh, used a lot. And there is a video coming soon above here and below linked in the description um, that's walking through how you can do one of those. You can gather this information from search logs. Uh, and then I also have a video already up linked above as well as below talking about how you can gather terminology from the assets that you already have. We are going to be using a pre-existing vocabulary of sorts to populate our quote unquote cards. And so that's going to be our pizza menus. As you saw in the no code taxonomy video, that's how I started. So let's go ahead and populate that. And I'm going to speed it up so that you can uh, get through this video quickly, but you can always slow this down and pause it if you need to. Okay, so you'll notice that there are a few things that I did not do correctly. So Bigfoot, I am going to keep both Anish caps because Bigfoot is sort of like a brand name in this category. But Chicago Crust should not be capitalized and same with personal pan. So let's go ahead and change that. So you see that it changed. Let's go through that a few more times with the changes. You'll also notice that I spelled something wrong because I was typing quickly. So, so now it looks more uniform. So let's pause here for a second. This has taken some time to even populate this small list. Now, this is not a tutorial on how to use Protege. 
but there is a faster way to do that, and that is here. Now, before you do this, make sure you are on the highest level of class that you wanna be on. So in this case, we're going to say thing. So I'm going to go into create class hierarchy. Now here, if you've already walked through the hierarchy process uh, that you saw in the no code taxonomy video, you can go ahead and do that in this screen. Let me just show you what that would look like. All right, so now you see the chicken and then buffalo chicken. Because I have indented it, it's going to make this a child of chicken. You can also do some prefix suffix kind of things in here. We're not gonna go through, again, this is not a tutorial on protege. So we don't need to worry about those right now. So you see chicken and then buffalo chicken. Great, and you can see that it already knows that that is a subclass. Great. So let's walk through adding the rest of the ingredients. All right, so I have manually typed these in. Again, that's gonna take you some time. So if you already have these scraped from your search logs or you have something else like uh, an Excel sheet or something, you can just copy and paste them in. Now I'm going to go through and check to make sure that I didn't make any typos. All right, so we have everything populated. So let's go ahead and continue. Now, here is where if you've already gone through a hierarchy creation process, you really want to use this uh, sibling class disjoint. And that's because if you don't do this, you'll have to manually put them in later. Uh, but for what we are doing, we are following the same process that we did in the video. So we didn't have a hierarchy. So we're going to unselect this. Ta-da, now everything is populated. Here is where you can go in and get a feel for the data. That's what I usually do. I look at what's in there, kind of like what I would use as a hierarchy to begin with, even before I talk to anyone. That's really just for me to get my head in the game and really understand what I'm doing. So um, I can see here that I do have types of sauces and I can see that I have different toppings. and Here's what I'm kind of doing at this point. I'm walking through what are those categories. So I'm going to go ahead and start making those categories. And I'm going to take this larger population and start putting them into the categories. Oops, and you can see that I accidentally made sauce a subclass of size. All you have to do is drag it back up to thing and it corrects itself. All right, so what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to start to move through and populate. So a Sicilian is a type of pizza. I don't have type of pizza yet, so let me add that. Pizza type. So I'm going to just drag Sicilian up to pizza type. Spinach is a topping, beef is a topping, tomato topping. So I'm going to go through this and I'm gonna speed it up for you. All right, so let's look at what we've got so far. We have a few things that are left over and that's okay. So now we can figure out what is a square cut, circle cut. Those both sound like types of cuts. So let's perhaps make another category for these to go into. Now you'll notice that I'm dragging and dropping, but you can easily just go over here to subclass, especially if something is too long. And you can say that this is class hierarchy, go to thing, and we can see pizza cut. 
There we go. Circle cut. Pizza cut. Okay. All right, cool. So that's done. And then we see something called dough and something called cheese sticks. Well, I don't know what cheese sticks is. So we could just leave it hanging out there, but usually you want to have something for this to belong to. So for now, we're just going to say an appetizer. We can go down to cheese sticks, add it as an appetizer. All right. Now, when you're doing real taxonomies um, to put out into production, this is bad. Don't do this. So what this is called is called an orphan. It means that something only belongs to one subclass or um, a subclass only belongs to one parent. That's not great because then you can see taxonomy bloat. So just be careful when you're doing that. For now, we're just thinking about organization before we start to talk to our end users. So this should be okay for now. We also have something called dough. So that's interesting. Let's go and look at different areas that dough might have surfaced. So dough is, is a type of crust. So we've got pizza type, but these all seem like different types of dough. So, so maybe pizza type actually should be dough. So let's try to correct that. So let's go up to refactor, rename entity, and rename it to dough. Oh, what do you know? It knew dough was a class we already had, and it automatically put that hierarchy together for us. So that's pretty nice. All right, and going back to our video, we also have pizza pan. Maybe that's really what size means. So let's go ahead and change that. There we go. We have dough. That's already something that we've accounted for. We have sauce. Yep, we've got sauce and we've got topping. So far, we are at timestamp 952 in the video. Now you notice we have found in the video that sauce is not necessarily something that is all types of sauces. There's the sauce that you can dip your pizza into, and then there's also the sauce that you put on top of the pizza. That is a disambiguation. So there are a few different ways that you can do that. So you can have completely different classes, one for pizza sauce, another for dipping sauce. And then you would wanna make sure that those are disjointed because they are different. Or you could use sauce as your main category and you could have pizza sauce as a subclass and then dipping sauce as a subclass so that all of those things are contained. It's totally up to you which direction you go in. Just keep your use case in mind. Now for our use case, people are making a pizza. They are selecting what they want on their pizza. So normally you don't need to know what kind of sauce to dip your pizza in while you are figuring out what sauce to put on your pizza. So we are going to have these as two distinct classes. They are not going to be subclasses of sauce. Now there is one tricky one related to dipping sauce and that is blue cheese. Technically, blue cheese is a type of cheese, but blue cheese is also a common way of people talking about a dipping sauce or a salad dressing kind of sauce. So again, if you are creating a pizza, are you putting blue cheese crumbles on a pizza or are you giving people the option to have a dipping sauce called blue cheese? If we go along with our video, we decided that this was a type of dipping sauce. So we're going to move that as well. Now, one thing I'm noticing is this toppings area is really large and it's a little bit confusing. If I was trying to make a pizza and I wanted to look at all the different toppings, would I want this laundry list of things? 
what if I don't eat meat? I wouldn't want to have to read through all the different types of meat. I would want to just skip to the vegetables and other things that I'm allowed to eat. So going along with our video, we would want to have some subclasses. We are at timestamp 1122, by the way. All right, so in our video, we did look through the entire list of toppings and decided that there were meats, fruits, vegetables, and we also did classify cheese as a topping because you can choose not to have any cheese. So let's move cheese down to toppings. And there we go. So cheese is now a subclass and all the different types of cheeses are a subclass. So let's go through and check all the meat and stick it in where they belong. You can go one at a time or like me, you are just using it as a pick list where you just go through and check where everything belongs as you go. All right, so we can use the vocabulary as it is now. At this stage, we have now included what we have determined from our user video, i.e. the no code taxonomy video where we were working with our end users to determine what the hierarchy might look like. So that is where the taxonomists and the knowledge engineers get back into play, where you can look at how the users have interpreted the information and you can add refinement to that if you think it will be helpful to the end goal of your users. So in meat, it, we have beef. Well, steak is a type of beef. We have chicken has a subclass already. And then there's quite a few things about pork. So let's go ahead and add pork. All right, so now if you were really hungry for a pizza and you wanted to look through the different types of meat toppings, you would see there's pork, beef, and chicken to select from. Now you'll notice we did this again where there's only one subclass of fruit. Do you actually need that? That's something that you need to decide. If this is something very important to your interface or very important to your uh, search algorithm or something that you know people are constantly trying to find, you can decide to have this as a standalone without having a, a higher level category or class, or you could leave it as a subclass. Do not feel like you have to make everything a subclass. You don't have to. It really depends on what you really think your users are going to use and then do testing with the users to understand if that's accurate or not. Okay, so now you have to do some housekeeping. So the hierarchy and adding and populating the terminology is some of the bigger components of creating one of these taxonomies. But you also wanna make sure that you have labels, you have UIDs or URIs. If you have any synonyms throughout your user experience testing, this is a good place to put those. So let's walk through a few examples. So dipping sauce, we're going to make an annotation and we're going to say RDF label. And we're going to say that this label is dipping sauce. All right, we wanna make sure that we put the language because we wanna make sure that the machine understands which language we're speaking. It doesn't really know and you have to tell it. Okay, so now we've got dipping sauce as the label all right, so we need to make sure that we understand what the pref label, so the main label. We have the general label, but we also may have alternate labels, different synonyms. We need to make sure that we tell the machine what is our preferred visual of this concept. We're gonna do it this way. Go ahead and add SCOS, which is uh, a standard schema for vocabularies. Highly recommend reading up on it. I'm also going to have a video on it coming soon. So we're going to do pref label. And you can see that the IRI shows up that it already knows this exists out on the web because it's a standard. So we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna select that. And we're going to say the pref label is dipping sauce. 
and we wanted to make sure that language is set at English and we're going to say OK. Now there might be a synonym of this, right? So we can go ahead and add that. Okay, so this one is also going to come from SCOS, again, because it's very common to vocabularies that have alt labels and pref labels and those sort of things. Alt label just means synonym. Oops, and you can see that because I did not put SCOS, which is the namespace first, it doesn't really know what I'm talking about. So let's correct that. SCOS, alt, label. You can see now that it understands what that is, so that's a good indication to me that I got it right. The alt label to this is salad dressing. It's also in English. I'm going to say OK. Now, we want to make sure that the machine understands that dipping sauce is different from every other class at its same hierarchical level. So let's close all of these for a second so we can see what that looks like. So we want to make sure that it understands that dipping sauce is different from all of these different classes. So this is how you would do that. And I just held down control when I did that on the keyboard. I'm going to say OK, and you can see that now it is disjointed with all of them. Let's try a few more. Now, more to come on why alt labels doing it this way are important. Hopefully, <laughs> next week we'll have a video on that. We'll see. Uh, but it's really great for adding more context to your search engine and your machine learning, just as a little preview. Now, maybe we have a specific brand of blue cheese that we like. Let's say Hidden Valley. So we can add an instance. Now, I'm going to add the instance on the fly like this, but I'm also going to show you how you can do it with a pre-populated method. So we're going to say, oops, hidden valley. Okay, cool. So now hidden valley is an instance. It is a very specific kind of blue cheese. We're going to say, okay, you can see that it shows up. Now, if we wanted to do this as a pre-population, we can go to individuals, we can go here, and we can go ahead and add farmer's market as another type. Cool. All right. So now we know these two. You can see you can add these types, the broader level types, in this visual as well. But I like to do it while I'm going through the vocabulary itself. Now, what if all of these dipping sauces, maybe my main supplier is Hidden Valley. There's a quicker way of adding this. Instead of doing an instance here, we can go to dipping sauce. We can say instance, hidden valley. Now here is where having a hierarchy is important when you are getting into the knowledge graph space or the ontology space. All right, so for each of these classes, you're going to want to make sure the label, pref label, and alt label are all filled in. And you might be asking yourself, well, what about those UIDs? So first of all, your vocabulary, if you are using at least Protege, is going to be creating these URIs for you. So you can actually use that as your UID. The interesting thing is we wrote these in as human readable. So this says blue cheese, this says barbecue. But machines don't know that's an actual thing. It just knows that it's a string of characters. So if you wanted to make this URI, say something other than blue cheese at the end, which isn't really preferable because blue cheese can change. It might need translation. Every time you change this label, you are going to have to re-index everything. So using the string is not preferable. So what you can do instead is you can say that this refactor, and we're going to change blue cheese to be one, two, three, four. That's the UID. A bad UID, but that's okay. And you might say to yourself, well, that's weird. It still says blue cheese. Yes, because Protege is very helpful where it allows you to view things by different properties. So right now we are rendered by the label, right? Remember label for this is blue cheese. Great. So that's human readable. But if we wanted to search and look at it only from the URI or the UID, it's one, two, three, four. 
So just make sure that you keep that in mind when you are looking at anything that is built out of protege or in ontologies in general. Usually this string here is more important than whatever label you are actually seeing. You can also add that as an annotation. And we're going to do that with Dublin core. So Dublin core is DC. And then in this case, you see that it's already identified DC as uh, DC elements. So if you want to go and look at all the different elements you can select from, you can certainly do that. But for us, we are going to say this is identifier. And it understands what that is. So good. All right. So we've got DC identifier and we're going to say it's one, two, three, four. Cool. That is also integer. So it doesn't have a language. We're going to say yes. So there you go. One, two, three, four. You can see one, two, three, four. All right. So that is the ID. You don't necessarily have to do the DC identifier here, but it is certainly encouraged to make sure it's part of your metadata. All right, so that concludes the portion of coding the no code taxonomy video that you might hopefully have seen before this. And in the meantime, I am going to load this file to the description below so you can go and try this out yourself. Stay tuned for the coding the no code knowledge model video that will be coming next. All right, and so that is how you would take your hands-on no-code exercises and actually turn it into something actionable so you can do something else with it. All right, with that, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'm gonna go out and enjoy the day and I hope you do too. I'll catch you next time.